Meli, can we start that? Thank you, Meli. So, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon for those of you joining from Europe or elsewhere. Um, it's a real pleasure again to have you this week at our CAT conference. Um, and today we have a really good friend uh, who I love very much, uh, Ari Finkelstein from Tel Aviv, uh, who's going to talk to us about TAVI and coronary occlusion. Thanks, thanks, Ari. Thanks for joining us. Okay, thank you so much for having me, and uh, I truly have good friends uh, here. And as we said, the two fellows of our department. So hello to Tzach and uh, to Isi, to I. And uh, I'm going to talk about what I do think that it is probably the hottest topic in cover today, and probably the <clears throat> only the, one of the only real issues of complication that we are truly worried about those days, and namely tower and corner occlusion. Now I'm gonna talk um, about this uh, because we had long time ago, this patient who is 83 years old, female with multiple risk factors, pulmonary edema, and you can appreciate that he had, that she had uh, stones there instead of aortic valve with critical aortic stenosis. Now I'll cut you a long story short, but we started the implantation with the old core valve. We did a high implantation, as you can see. Oh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> and we released it in a good position. And uh, this is the final result that looks pretty nice, with no leak, and you know that we're all looking mainly here. None of us. Uh, was looking those days at anything else. But a few hours later, the patient collapsed. We brought her quickly to the cat lab, and that's what we saw. And this is what frustration means. You think that you uh, had a wonderful result, but it was not. And as my father used to say, never ever count your money on the stairs while uh, running around the stairs because uh, you might fall. <clears throat> So I'm gonna talk about tavern coronary occlusion. I'm gonna mention a few words about the magnitude of the problem, then the risk factors, what's the mechanism, <clears throat> the outcome, how to prevent it, uh, how to treat it. And then uh, probably the, the, the most important uh, part of this topic that I keep to the end is uh, tave and tav uh, and coronary obstruction. Now, regarding the magnitude of the problem, well, we had a few papers, many more than this. Probably the first and the most important one was uh, um, given by Ribeiro that published this, and uh, he took the pooled studies those days of Tower, and he showed us that the coronary obstruction is in, a, in about 0.35%, uh, and in the acute phase, much more common with the sapien valve than with core valve that was supraannular and with this net and does not occlude the artery. <clears throat> now we've shown us that there is no difference between transfemoral, transapical, or transaortic. But later on, Igal Abramovich, who was a fellow of ours as well with Raj Makar, have shown us that 28% of their pooled analysis was in cases of valve in valve which is much more than the part in the TAVA procedure. Danit Veer in his uh, huge registry of valve involved showed that the main uh, problem was patients with um, um, prosthetic valve stenosis, no regurgitation, and all the combined ones. And then you asked him have shown us that the um, early occlusion, the acute occlusion was much, much more um, a common with the balloon expandable, but in left, but in later um, uh, coronary occlusion, the self expandable was much, much higher. <clears throat> now, what are the risk factors? Well, we have all known in the beginning that the left coronary distance from the annulus is shorter according to PM, to CT, as well as to angiography. And we have learned from this uh, register of Ribeiro that 83% were uh, the left main as well, only 12% were right and only 4% were both of them. The left main hate with people, with, with patients with uh, occlusion, 
was less than uh, 10 millimeters, as opposed to much larger one in those without. And the sinus of Valsalva was smaller significantly than those without occlusion. And as a matter of fact, up to 86% of patients who had coronary occlusion had the left main height of less than 12%, and the sinus of Valsalva in the majority was smaller than 30 millimeters. Female gender, um, as expected, was a risk factor since everything is smaller there, and prior cabbage is a protective factor. Well, this is reasonable. Now, Igor Amarmovich shown us as well, uh, again, that the sapien in the acute phase of coronary occlusion was much, much higher uh, with the balloon expandable, much less of that in the core valve. The left main height again, and the calcium node was a risk factor as well. Now, later on, um, um, Danny Zier have taught us this with valve in valve. And we know today that valve in valve is probably uh, the main risk factor for coronary occlusion. And in order to understand this, we got to understand the, the way that the um, tower valve is sitting within the failed bioprosthetic valve. Now the predictors are three groups. One is the prosthetic valve factor. The second one is the anatomical factor of the patient. And the third one is the TAVI valve factor. Now regarding the bioprosthetic valve, in order to understand, we have to know a little bit better about bioprosthetic valve. Now bioprosthetic valve could be stented valve like those that can be either bovine or porcine, and they can be either stentless, like bovine or porcine, or homograph. <clears throat> but more important than that, we have to know and realize the way that a prosthetic valve is being built. And this is the stent post, the base ring, and the prosthetic itself. That in a valve like Edward Perrimont, for instance, or the Metronic Hancock, the valve itself sits within the base and the stand post. So the stand post kind of protect the outer part, namely the coronaries from the uh, valve, from the prosthetic valve. In another group, like the mitral flow, the valve itself is sitting outside the base ring and the stand post, and there is nothing to protect the ostium of the left main or the right coronary from this valve that can be extended into the coronaries. This is true to the mitral flow. This is true for the tri trifecta as well. In other words, if we are going from valves that are inner to the post, as opposed to the mitral flow who is outer to the post, we are going from low to high-risk procedures. Now, the tava, the anatomical factors of the patient itself, is the narrow and low-lying sinus ST junction, the low coronaries, the shallow sinus of Valsalva, and of course, rain-planted coronaries. And the tava procedure factors are the height of the implantation. Whenever we implant it higher, the risk is higher extreme oversizing that we're doing sometimes, balloon expandable in the acute phase and retrievable versus non-retrievable or forgiving valve that can be changed according during the procedure. So in summary, the risk factors for coronary occlusion are women, balloon expandable valve, valve valve procedure, low left coronary artery less than 12 millimeter, and small sinus of Valsalva. Now, what's the mechanism? <clears throat> now, usually in the acute phase, the mechanism is just displacement of left coronal leaflet over the left main. This looks like this in a cartoon. In life, it looks like this. Have a look. This is the calcified valve that moves just like a door into the ostium of the coronary artery. Again, you see, this is the calcified valve. We inflate the balloon and it just moves like a door and closes 
the ostium of the left main. Another risk is what we call sequestration of the sinuses that can be either because there is deficient sinus or there is a very short or, or, or a, a small sinus that the valve can reach from side to side and just block it. Now, Azim has shown in his beautiful paper the difference between early and late coronary occlusion, and we're probably going to discuss this uh, with your help later on. Now, even without the CT, just in coronary angio, you can appreciate here that these sinuses are not just small, the distance is not just as short, but they are completely flat. And there is no way that if you put here a valve, you're not going to block the coronaries. And if you inflate here and inject just QCC, you can see that this is completely blocked. Now, if you implant this valve in spite of it, and I'm showing you something that we have done in the beginning of the Tava days, we did not realize that, and the implantation looks beautiful, and the patient felt wonderful, but you can see that the sinuses are completely blocked. So it's just gonna be a matter of time that those arteries are gonna get ischemia. And this is what we have. Six months later, the patient becomes ischemic with unstable angina. We'll go back to this patient later on, but you can see this. Here, it is blocked and ischemic, and here in the right coronary as well. Now, the mechanism of obstruction in valve in valve is somewhat a little bit different because the main problem or the main risk is displaced surgical valve leaflet that is covering the ostium of the coronary artery. Like here, for instance, or like here that there are sinuses, but there is a sequestration or blockage of them from side to side and no way of blood to enter the coronaries. Now, what's the outcome? Well, if the obstruction is just partial like this, you can see there is a high pinch of the left coronary artery, this is one story. You can treat it. But if this is a complete, and this is again uh, with a magnification to show you the ostium. But if it's like this, complete occlusion, well, the story is completely different. And in this uh, register of Ribeiro, it's shown us that 18% of the cases were unsuccessful. And in those cases with unsuccessful, the mortality was 100%. If there is a successful, well, the results are much better. And you have shown us that the difference between early and late is the timing that in the self-expandable valve, which is mainly late corner obstruction, the timing is here. While when we're talking about balloon expandable, or valve involved, the time is much, much close to the procedure. So what have we learned so far? Well, confused, we too, me, me too. There is partial or complete, there is early or late, there is self-expandable or balloon expandable, and there is a full valve or valve or tav in tav, et cetera. And I'm not gonna show you again this sausage and registry and what does it mean. So how can we prevent it? Well, the first prevention and the most important by far is good clinical and CT pre-procedural evaluation. When the coronary arteries are close to the annulus, try to use retrieval devices and plan all details to do a coronary protection. Now, this CT is now a tool that is getting more and more importance before the procedure. You can see exactly the distance of the corners. You can measure, of course, the uh, distance, and you can anticipate just imaginary uh, prosthetic valve within and see what can happen to the corners and what the distance 
after you implant it. And you can see it here. If here is the left coronary, we're scrolling up, and here we get into the left coronary. And when we get to the left coronary that is here, you can measure the distance and how much it's going to block it and how much it's going to save it. You can go forth and then backwards and see and appreciate and anticipate the, um, um, the risk of coronary occlusion. It's getting even more complicated when we're talking about the valve in valve because the prosthetic valve or the uh, bioprosthetic valve could be coaxial aligned to, uh, um, uh, to the annulus, and, but it can be like this. So if it's not coaxial, the distance between the valve and the ostium is very near, just like in a patient that does not have sinuses like this, but rather flat sinuses, and there is a near zero, what we call the VTC. Remember this term, it's gonna be extremely important in the very near future. VTC, which is near zero, is almost absolute contraindication to do this procedure without any further measures before. <clears throat> so in any case that you have this risk, first of all, consider general anesthesia and TEE. Be careful. Second, select a smaller diameter valve if it's borderline. Don't take the bigger one. Try to take a retrievable dev a device that can be forgiving. You can just stop the procedure, take it out, and uh, uh, just uh, plan your way uh, second. And then, in cases that you need, you should do preemptive left main pr protection with a guide dryer with or without a stand. And this is what it looks like. You see, this is a patient with a very shallow uh, sinus and very, very close coronaries. <clears throat> when you inflate the, the, the balloon here, you can see that it is almost occluding the left main. Well, this is not just like it is because you remember that this is three-dimensional. So what you see here is like 100% blockage. Well, it's not because it might be not exactly opposing and blocking the left main. In any case, you put a guiding catheter in the left main with a wire with or without a stent within. And then you start to implant the valve. I want to remind you just the small details that when you implant this, sometimes you have first to put the valve and only then go and put the um, um, guiding catheter and the wire, because just like in life, always the bigger is stronger. And if you put this first and you employ, deploy the valve here, it will take this and throw it away. Now, before releasing to a good shot, leave this in and have a look. It looks okay, and then you can release it. Now, after releasing it, I'm still with the guide wire, with the guiding catheter, with the guide wire inside, and then I give injection with the guiding catheter in, I see this regurgitation of contrast media, and then I take the guide wire out and inject from outside. And again, you can see that there is a to and fro regurgitation of contrast media that means that the and left main is patterned. And then you can inject and you can see that it's fulfilled. In extreme cases, preemptive coronary protection with or without the stand, but then try to do this, what we call the chimney. And this is a mitral flow that is seven millimeters from the uh, um, coronary, from the left coronary and the flat sinus there is no chance that this will go uneven. So we put a guide wire and a stand that is coming from the distal part of the left main and goes up, it's a long stand, just like a chimney up to the upper part of the valve. 
So we are inflating it. I'm using it rapid pacing with a stand here and a stand here and then deploy it. And then you can see the results. Now, regarding the chimney, there is pro and cons. The advantage is it's- Eric, sorry, yeah. one second. Just change your slides a little slower, please, because okay. they're saying there's a little bit of delay. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. <clears throat> okay, so the advantage of preemptive or what we call chimney is that it is really simple. There is nothing new, nothing that we have never done before. We have done tower, we have done coronary intervention. So you just combine it together. And the only tip, as I said, is don't forget that if you first deploy the guiding catheter, the heavy, big aortic valve that you deploy might take it all and throw it away and even harm the coronary sinuses. But otherwise, it's very simple. The disadvantage is that it might be difficult to remove if you don't need it, mainly with balloon expandable. There is always the risk of osteal stent thrombosis. The leaflet coverage is not snorkel if it's not high enough or if the stent is not long enough. You might need or you need a lifelong dual antiplatelet therapy. And three, one third of cases, there is some kind of obstruction late uh, in the course, and there is limited retrospective data. Now, uh, Marcos Paziano has collected those cases. We were uh, part of it as well. And he has collected cases that uh, all of them were intermediate to high risk. There was a high percentage of valve in valve procedure. There was high percentage of mitral flow and all of them were with low height of the left main and a very narrow sinus of Valsalva. The vast majority, as I said, were self-expandable either evolute or the um, uh, portico valves. And the cardiovascular mortality in this registry was pretty high, not just because the left main was problematic, but rather because they were all uh, very sick with high risk patients. Another option is of course the basilica, which you probably all know. And the basilica, you know, in a cartoon looks pretty simple. You're taking a wire and you are crossing through the valve with one and with a snare with the other one. And you are joining them together. We get the um, the wire um, with the snare, and then you can just tear it with the elect electrical force that is cutting it and create just uh, two pieces uh, of any uh, leaflet that you want. Well, in life, this is what it looks like. You cross with one, you cross with the um, um, snare, and then you collect them together and you cut it. Well, it looks somewhat um, violent. Well, it is, but the advantage is that it directly addresses leaflet issue. There is no alteration in post-tower antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy. And there is of course easier future access to the coronaries. The disadvantage is that it requires an additional skill set. And I'm telling you, this is not additional skill set. This is huge additional skill set. This is huge time consuming. There is always risk of embolism. And according to the registry, there is a, a really increased risk of stroke. Now Khan has published this uh, in JAK intervention of 30 subject at four sites. And uh, well, I'm not gonna go through all the inclusion and exclusion, but what it's important is that a little bit more than half of the cases were bioprosthetic, but almost half of them were native valves. 
the successful acceleration was in about 100%, was in 100% of patients, but the time to do it was more than two hours mean of the procedure. And the technical success was almost 100%. The point is that 10% of patients has stroke. The good news is that none of them had coronary obstruction. Now, another uh, uh, toy that we're gonna have in the very near future is the Liftlex that is having now the second generation that is much, much easier than what we know. I'll go into the real deal here. So this is, as a matter of fact, cutting the, um, the leaflet, the calcified leaflet uh, with it, but this is pretty violent and we're not using it yet. We tried one case and now we're waiting for the new generation of this device. Now, how should we treat it? Well, as we said, the best treatment is the prevention. Good clinical and CT pre-procedural evaluation and when the corners are close to the unused, use a retrievable device. But if it occurs, well, in a case like this that I've shown you, it is pretty easy to treat. You put a stent because it's still open, you deploy it, and this is what it looks like at the end. If it's a self-expandable, again, you still have an entrance, you deploy a stent, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> and in some cases like this that I've shown you before, that is a late coronary obstruction that created in this lady a global ischemia, well, there is always another choice because you cannot reach, it's impossible to reach the left or the right corner. So there is always this choice that we do not want to reach. It's a lima to the LED and there is a rima to the right coronary artery. Now, the most important thing today, well, that's my opinion, is what we call the Tav and Tav and coronary obstruction. And this is because I got the kind of a deja vu of what we had uh, like 20 years ago, the restenosis that became a very, very major part of our procedures. And we're going to have this restenosis with Tavar after seven, eight, ten, or more years with failed bioprosthetic Tavar valves. Now, Adam Witkowski had collected the first um, registry, and the vast majority of them were due to either low or high position implantation. And then Schmidt had collected 19 patients with aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation will failed by a prosthetics. And this other registry in the cardiovascular in Jack imaging showed us five cases uh, of tav in tav procedure with satisfactory hemodynamic result. It was in those days that I truly admit, I couldn't appreciate the risk of doing this. So luckily this patient had a failed bioprosthetic valve with AI with the paravalvular and valvular leak. So we deployed here a balloon valvuloplasty and then we went into a, 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 a balloon expandable valve and I want to emphasize this one very important thing as a tip of an operator. Whenever you have a self-expandable valve, which is quite horizontal, remember that deploying another self-expandable valve here might be very, very tasking because the valve is gonna stuck here and does, want, does not want to go inside. And the only way to do it 
is not because you need a balloon extendable, but rather you need a, a, a TAVI valve with a flexible delivery system. Otherwise, you cannot flex it and get into the um, uh, into the left ventricle. Now we deploy it. And I want to remind you that the behavior of deployment of a TAV in TAV is different. They don't shorten in 80% from here and 20 here, and they move sometimes either upper or lower. So it acts different than a native valve implantation. But the results were beautiful. So we were happy. And this is another case with a failed uh, sapien valve and in this case we inflated this and went back with a self-expandable valve that in this case since it was not horizontal it went in and then the implantation a little bit lower just because it's supra annular and we didn't want to block the coronaries, and this is uh, easy to perform. And another post dilatation that has to do always whenever you have tav and tav, because there are not matching always one another, and this is the final. Now, we had this redo and tav and tav huge registry those days. And the Redo Tavi Tavi International Registry is collecting in those days more than 400 cases in 35 participating centers after at least one year. Now, 0.3% of Tavi population are Tavi and Tavi today. The median time is about 13 to 72 months in this registry with a follow-up of three to three years. And the indication were stenosis in about one third, regurgitation in about one third, and, and uh, combined in about one third, and regurgitation in almost one third of cases. Now, a redo tower was associated with significant and persistent symptomatic improvement they were associated with favorable clinical and echocardiographic outcome. And the result was a, a call for further study, et cetera, et cetera. But here comes our patient recently. She was 85 years old, eight years after Tavar with a core valve 26 millimeter. And she was the snake, she was symptomatic. And on TTE, she had severe valvular regurgitation. On coronary angiography, she had non-significant coronary artery disease. Now, this is her CT. Now, watch carefully. Her height of the coronary is pretty high, but her sinuses are pretty shallow. And you can see it, the distance to the left main, the distance to the right, but the sinuses are pretty shallow, mainly the right one. And when you measure the, uh, what we call the uh, VTC, the um, distance between the prosthetic valve to the ostium of the coronary, in the left main, it was 3.3. On the right, it's only 0.9%. Now look what happens here again. You see the distance. Now, this is the other measurement, the angle recommended, etc. Now, this is the first injection. You can see the right here. You can see the left here. We put a wire, a guiding catheter, and we put a long stent within the guide liner. We put a guide liner within the left main coronary and just left the uh, stent within just in case we need it. And now we're going with this uh, self-expandable S3 valve. Now remember, 
The distance, the VTC on the right was much shorter, but we did not notice that. So we protected the left main, which was much, much bigger than the right, which was like co-dominant. And we deployed the valve. Now have a look. And I want you to, to notice this again and again, because this is extremely teaching. I'll go back to this. I'm sorry. I want you to see this. Have a look. I'm putting the valve here. Now, here I just um, consider it like a new implantation without considering the previous valve. And if this is the line of the so called old annulus, so I just put the new valve here as you are doing every day with this just on the line of the annulus. But where, when we are deploying it, sorry, I'll start from the beginning. Have a look now what happens. Okay, this is here. Now it's gonna shorten from here and the valve here is not getting short as you get expected in native first time valve. So what we have here is two valves that in between is something that is squeezed. And this is the guiding catheter, the guide liner and the stand inside. So what we're having here looks like very nice result. The valve is in place. There is no AI at all, and it looks like the corners are fulfilled. We're happy. You can even see here the shadow of the right corner artery, even though the injection is not directed to the right corner. But now I'm trying to take it out. It doesn't go, so I'm taking everything out. You see, I'm pulling it, whoops, and it went out. I was very happy. You should have seen the guideliner. It was like a spiral in my hands. But we look at it, it looks fine. The patient is very stable. You can see that the left corner is okay. You can even see that injection here shows you that the left corner is fulfilled, the right corner is fulfilled. Everybody is happy. And the patient went back to the world. She was stable, she was happy. We're all happy. But three days later, the patient collapsed in the world, went into cardiogenic shock, asphysto, resuscitation, EMD, and she passed away. Three weeks later, we had another patient. She was 78 years old, nine years after Tavro with the core valve. And again, she had dyspnea and severe aortic valve stenosis and regurgitation. She, she as well had no significant coronary artery disease. And again, this is a CT. The right corner is 10 millimeters. The left corner is 15. And this is what you can see. Her sinuses are not too big. If, I'm, if I can say it's 23 uh, millimeter here, 23 millimeter here. And the distance here is better. It's 3.6 and 3.6. We'll get to it. You know, we say once bitten, twice shy. In Hebrew, uh, we say completely different. We say that if you got burned by hot water, beware of cold ones. So I didn't take a chance. And as you see, I put a guide wire and a catheter here in the right coronary artery it looks much, much more dangerous according to the sinus. The sinus here is much bigger. All right, again, and here this time, I'll stop it. I want you to see there is a catch because I want to deploy the valve lower, a little bit lower. And this is gonna, what's gonna be in the future our uh, common practice. When we're implanting the second valve, we're gonna implant it a little bit lower, as lower as we can in order to gain good results. And in this 
very special patient in order not to harm the bio, the, the mechanical mitral valve that she has here, I'm sorry. So we are deploying it. You see, I'm starting it lower than expected here. And now the implantation, as you see, looks frightening what, somewhat, but it's a little bit lower. And when you end it, look at it again and again. When you end it, the upper side of the S3 valve with those holes here, still not above the corners. You see the corners are here. When it's going, to be deployed, it will end here. So it's sitting nice. It's sitting definitely below the coronaries. It does not harm them and it does not occlude them. And this is the final result. You can see the wire is still here. I'm still frightened, as I said, got burned with hot water and it's open. And here I take the wire out there is nice result, there is no AI and no coronary occlusion, and even the femorals uh, are closed well. Now, this is one of the most important papers uh, published recently by uh, Tomaki and uh, Raj Makar, and they have compared patients with a coronary risk for obstruction to those without. And I truly recommend all of you to read this paper again and again, because it shows you the risk of what the mechanism of corner obstruction due to sinus, to sinus sequestration in redo tavo, whether it's evolute in evolute, whether it's evolute in, ev uh, in the pro in a pro, or whether it's sapien in evolute or vice versa. Because whenever the evolute is here and it's supraannular, its valves are here. And if they are being pushed by the second valve, they can easily close the corners if the sinus is not big enough, wide enough, and mainly tall enough. This is true for evolute in evolute. This is true for um, um, sapien in evolute as well it is much, much less important if the first valve was sapient. And this is again, this illustration that you can see the commissure levels as uh, compared um, uh, to the tower valve. And what they have seen is that the left coronary, the right coronary, both or one or both, the risk is extremely higher when the prior valve was evolute R or pro, as opposed to the very, very low risk if the first valve was a sapien, a balloon expandable, which is shorter and not supraannular. So the huge advantage that we used to have and we still have with supraannular valve for cases like valve in valve is a huge disadvantage when you are going to Tav and Tav uh, in a later um, uh, time uh, in this patient. And in their registry, well, you can see that there was a, a, a significant difference regarding the uh, occurrence of this um, risk in males as opposed to female, the BSA of smaller people with corner occlusion, with corner risk of occlusion as expected. And all these measurements of annular area, of diameter, of LVOT area, of sinus of Valsalva, and, and the, the height, the diameter, and even the ascending aorta, all of them are significantly smaller in patients with risk of coronary obstruction after tav in tav than those without. And the sinotubular junction height as well, a significant difference. Now in summary, coronary obstruction during and after TAVI 
is still one of the last serious complications associated with high mortality rate. Low left main head, shallow sense of salva, and valve in valve procedures contribute to higher risk of coronary occlusion during and after TAVI. And the use of balloon expandable valve is associated with a much higher risk of acute coronary obstruction, while self expandable is associated with higher risk of late coronary obstruction, as you have shown in your paper. But most important, prevention is best utilized using a meticulous pre procedural imaging and measurements. Prevention and treatment during the procedure is best utilized with preemptive coronary protection for high risk patients. For extreme risk, either chimney basilica or maybe in the future the leaflets may be used with considerable safety and high efficacy. And in partial obstruction, the success of treating the coronary the, the obstruction with PCI is very, very successful. But last but not least, and I think that this is probably the take on most important message of this talk. There is truly a positive data regarding the risk of coronary obstruction due to steam sequestration in read to tower in tower. This risk should be carefully evaluated again and again using pre-procedural CT angel, mainly in patients with low height and shallow ST junction. In patients with low ST junction and relative long life expectancy, a transcatheter half valve, heart valve with low commissural height should be preferred to avoid the risk of coronary obstruction due to sinus sequestration in future tower in tower procedure. And this is gonna be part of our decision making in the future in choosing the right valve to the right patient. Thank you so much for your attention. Arik, thank you so much. Uh, that presentation was phenomenal. There's, there's so much to think about, and I'm sure we, there are gonna be quite a few questions from the participants. Um, you know, we've just been talking ourselves, and I mean, the whole question of, you know, what valve first, what valve second, you know, as we go to lower risk patients is gonna become something that we need to think about really actively. So we've got a number of fellows we're gonna bring on. Um, so here you see Sharon, uh, who's a fellow countryman of yours. <laughs> uh, he's also from Israel and Theo, who's one of our other fellows. And then we also have Zach uh, Rosenbaum will turn his uh, camera on. So it's like, oh, we're all family here today. <laughs> I, got, I, could, I, could give, I could give this talk in Hebrew much easier. <laughs> I was just about to say, don't start now doing the discussion in Hebrew, please. Because <laughs> we want to participate. So. I have a couple of questions. I'm gonna, I have, I'm gonna ask one question, then we're gonna go around with the fellows as well. And I think also one has a question. Um, so let's start in the beginning with, let's, let's do Tava and Tava last. And just with, you know, um, maybe valve and valve, right? In a, so Tava in a surgical valve. Now, a couple of questions I have. The one is, I was looking at the pictures you showed when you do coronary obstruction and you do a chimney. How long do you do the chimney? I mean, you seem to use very long stents. Uh, and do you think you need to be that long? Um, you know, just like anybody else, I don't think that there is a single person that have enough experience with many cases of chimney that can tell you a, an exact and based answer. Okay. But I'm taking the pro and con. First of all, look, I think that, you know, we should be truly humble regarding Tavo. We are rushing a little bit and we forgot that there are still surgery uh, for aortic stenosis. So a patient that we're doing chimney are supposed to be truly patient with high risk for surgery. You're not gonna do a chimney for a 75 years old healthy patient even up to an 80 years old patient who is healthy and can undergo surgery. Because chimney is, a, is kind of a no option procedure because I've shown you the disadvantages 
uh, you know, one third of the chimney procedures later on, this tent had to be retreated. And I'm saying this regarding your question, because I think that it is, I had a chance to treat one and it's much, much easier to get to a chimney when it's higher uh, with a 33 millimeter stand than when it is short and you have to go all the way and start uh, and try to dig it. It's much easier to dig it up than to dig it just within the valve. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason that I think that I should take a longer one. But as a matter of fact, uh, it depends because first of all, you see, I've never done a chimney in a balloon expandable valve because balloon expandable can just crash it and you won't be able to open it uh, correctly and it will do a stent thrombosis, etc. So I've used it in the few times that we have done it with a self-expandable. Now self-expandable itself, it's super annular. So it leaves you that if you want to do the chimney up to the upper part of the valve, it has to start with 20 something millimeters. So to your uh, question, I think that we should take a, a, a longer stand and a bigger one. So dilate it and do it as big as possible. And since we're talking about left main, you can do it with four millimeter stand and go even higher to a 4.5 or even close to five millimeter. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, one of the things, you know, I've been doing, um, Arik, is if the patient's stable, and I know the coronaries are low, low VTC, and the patient's stable, I see there's still coronary flow, I then try to recross. I, so I, I go with another guide catheter and I go through the stent stress into the coronary and I pull the jailed guide catheter out, okay? And then I do IVIS and if, I, if I'm unhappy with what the, the, not just the ostium, but the area outside the ostium looks like, I then chimney, but I chimney now inside my valve rather than outside of the valve. Uh, I didn't mention it, but this is definitely uh, the common practice. Okay. Uh, I, okay. I didn't want to go. Not look, too technical. I, I, I want to tell you something. I tried to build a, a, a talk for a very, very wide spectrum of, uh, of audience. Some of them are experienced tower uh, operators and some that are just very, very uh, new to this, like fellows. Okay. That's why I didn't go into very much uh, uh, technical details. But what you've just said, it goes without saying, of course. No, no, perfect. I just wanted to see if you were doing the same thing because I still see at meetings, people present cases of chimneys outside the valve. Uh, so I wanted to see what you were doing. Let's get the fellows involved, um, Eric, because I, I want us to make sure we answer their questions. Of course. Eric. Thank you very much for the talk. As usual, it was uh, very insightful and uh, in depth. Thank you. I have, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, we're doing TAVR in, in younger and younger patients. Do you think we should uh, plan their, their lifetime course, uh, so-called uh, in TAVR, as these patients may need two, three, and who knows, maybe four valves uh, during their lifetime? Uh, this is the first question. And the second one is, do we, like you said, basilica, we, we have techniques to deal with the coronary, to prevent coronary obstruction, but basilica and this technique are, are not perfect and can be time consuming. You think there's patients, there are too high risk uh, that we should consider sending to surgery? Well, I, I think that I have, uh, um, regarding the first question, if you look at my last slide, well, it's not on anymore, but the last sentence of my last slide was that in patient with long life expectancy, um, we should consider before doing TAVR to think about the next step. If we have a young patient that looks absolutely good for TAVR, what we used to sing absolutely good for TAVR and he's perfect candidate for TAVR. But until recently, 
we didn't take into account, but what happens in this guy is gonna need a tower and tower. Now, the fact that he does not have coronary artery disease, and there is a very good chance that he's not gonna need coronary intervention in the, in the future, this is not a good uh, and uh, an absolute proof that he should get stubborn. The absolute proof should be by measurement of the expected VTC of this patient within 10 years if you want to do then a tower in tower. And if this patient is 73 years old with a very good life expectancy and he has his VTC, anticipated VTC is very short, even though that he looks like a perfect Tavi candidate, I don't think that he should get Tavi. And if he should, and I emphasize this uh, very, very gently, because, you know, I love the self-expandable and I love the balloon expandable. I'm proctoring for both of them. And 2,400 cases that we have done here are about half and half. But still, I think that my way of thinking is a little bit changed for patients like this to anticipate the future, either not to do tower or to do it with a balloon expandable, not supraannular valve, that the tower and tower procedure later on will be much less risky for its coronaries. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's super important. And and we've all been guilty of not doing that, right? I mean, and we have to change our way of thinking. I mean, we really have to, um, when, when we look at a young patient, well, a patient with a long life expectancy, I'm gonna, I think that's probably a better description than young, a low risk patient. So a patient with a long life expectancy, we have to be, when we're looking, are they a good candidate for TAVA? We now need to take that next step is, are they a good candidate for TAVA in TAVA as well? right? Because what are we going to do? Because that valve is going to degenerate. And exactly. what are we going to do when they degenerate? And, you know, and there are times when we have to say, you know what, actually, maybe even though they're a good candidate for TAVA, the best operation for this patient, procedure for this patient is open heart surgery with, you know, um, root enlargement and a biological valve, right? That we can then do another ta a TAVA in, a valve in valve in the future, um, that would maybe give the patient a better uh, life expectancy and a no better. Doubt. No yeah. doubt, exactly. Yeah. And that's uh, th that's why I said, and I repeat it like a broken record. You know, Tzach, you know me. I'm not going to die of humbleness, okay? But I'm saying again and again, I have reached a, a, a time that I'm repeating it again and again. We should start being more humble with stubborn. And I think that I prefer this 74 or 73 years old patient to have surgery today and not cover today and surgery when he's 82 or 85 years old. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that uh, we should uh, just stop <clears throat> today, but I think that in our way of thinking, we should measure the sinuses in a way of planning our next step within 10 years. How is it going to look like? Because if his life expectancy is good, he is going to have another procedure. Thank you very much. Sharon Thea. Shalom, Professor Finkelstein. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, have a, I have several questions. The first one is um, sometimes despite um, a very meticulous pre-procedural planning, you're still struggling to understand in the end of the procedure, what's going on around the ostium, what's, what's going on with the coronary, right? So my question is, how, would you, how do you evaluate um, the coronary flow? Um, is it just angiography? Do you do IVUS? Do you use other tools to, to evaluate, um, you know, before de de deploying uh, the stent? Well, um, that's a very good question because I think that those days after I had this trauma with the patient 
Uh, I think that it should be kind of a common practice that by the end of every tower procedure, unless you know it's, you know, the simplest one with huge sinuses and very high corners, I think that in every procedure you should, by the end, not just inject the 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 aortic root to see whether you have or not have tiny AI, but uh, go back with coronary catheters and see how it looks like. Nothing is going to show you this better than just coronary angiography and small injection to each one of them and see what the distance, how is the flow, how far it is from the valve, etc., etc. You can do it with a CT later on as well. But we all know that going with the catheter and see where it is blocked and where it is not uh, is much more accurate like this. So if it goes easily, I truly recommend to give 4cc to each coronary and see whether you are going to have a problem or not. And do you use other tools to evaluate the coronaries or just, just angio? No, those days just angio. In cases that you have questions, yeah, you should do CT post procedure. CT and post -procedure. and, and the, read my lips. This is going to be part of the of the tower journey of a patient. Okay, a CT before, echo before, echo after, and CT after. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the, the one thing we do sometimes. Um, and we, we kind of building some data now, we'll try and publish it, Arik, so people can see, is we've been trying to, to do IVIS, okay? Uh, to try and understand, you know, is there enough space, not usually even around the coronary, but often when it's tava in tava or valve in valve, and we have like some interesting pictures. I mean, once where we were able to diagnose that actually the ostium was okay, but we were at risk of sinus sequestration because the gap between the new valve and the aortic wall was so tiny and we could see it almost being compressed there, right? Uh, and it changed our, our approach to the patient and we put a stent in, right? And part of this comes from my concern from, you know, the paper we published in Jack on delayed coronary obstruction. Because in that paper, you know, they, we found all these cases where experienced operators like me and you looked at the angiogram Okay, looked at the autogram often, maybe not selective, but sometimes even selective and said everything looked okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it looked, you know, and then two days later, three days later, the patient's arresting or getting ST elevation and so on. So I kind of still feel that there, there's still some patients we haven't understood, you know, perfectly why or what the risk factor is. And I think, you know, you showed some interesting cases and I wanted to congratulate you and thank you for being so honest and open with us because nobody, sh everybody shows their good cases. It takes a lot of, um, you know, humility and honesty to also show the ones that went badly. Okay, thank you. Sharon, you had another question or here? Yeah. Um, just, um, uh, do you have any, any special considerations for bicuspids in terms of, of coronary obstruction? Uh, any well, it's well known that bicuspid valve, since it is, look, first of all, this is not a lecture about bicuspid, but I can tell you that anyone who had the opportunity to do TAVR in Southeast Asia, and I've done a lot there uh, as a proctor, I can tell you that Bicuspid is a huge aquarium of so many fishes, different fishes. It's not just one uh, group of patients. Not even those that we are reading in the classification, uh, because the bicuspid that you see in Vietnam or in China are nothing similar to the bicuspid that we're seeing here and we're doing some. This is completely different animal. It's huge calcium, it's big leaflets, and the um, uh, risk of coronary occlusion there is much, much higher. Take into um, consideration the fact that it is asymmetrical and one sinus is very small and the other one is huge. 
it all changes the whole algorithm and the whole planning of your procedure. So the answer to your question is nothing that can go into a few minutes that we have, but in the bottom, yes, it's different. It's higher risk. It's more risky and it's not just more risky. It's going to be much, much more risky to treat if you have kind of coronary obstruction because of the huge calcification there. Thank you. Arik, um, a couple of from the panelists, uh, sorry, from the participants. So there was one messenger to you from uh, Dr. Yorde. Um, Uli is the head of heart failure. And so Asi is working with him. And he's just, again, congratulating how, what a great job Asi is doing and that he hopes to have future collaborations with, with you in Tel Aviv through Asi uh, on heart failure as well, not just structural heart. Um, and I'm sure... I'm sure that will happen. Uh, Asi has been phenomenal. Um, and then there's another comment here from Matias uh, in Argentina, uh, also asking about commissural alignment. And if we start doing systematic uh, commissural alignment, could this decrease the risk of coronary occlusion in Tava in Tava or sinus sequestration? What are your thoughts on commissural alignment? Well, there is no doubt that it will decrease it. Because, you know, this is a mathematical algorithm. What are your chances if it looks like this or it looks like this? So, of course, if it's not aligned, you are just enlarging the door that can close the coronary artery. Uh, of, instead of one valve, like two valves. So coronary alignment is, should be part of our procedure. The, the problem is that the alignment is based mainly on what we call empirical anatomical um, build of the vast majority of the human being. It's not a patient-oriented procedure. And, and, and I want to emphasize one very important thing, and sorry for, again, uh, using the, the, the term humble. We are moving from high-risk patients into lower and younger-risk patients. You know, guys, you cannot hold uh, the rope uh, in its two ends. Either we want to go to younger and lower-risk patients at the same time when we're moving in this indication creep, we cannot compromise on a tiny risk of safety and efficacy. You cannot compromise in a young patient that could easily have perfect result in surgery on doing TAVR and not promising him a perfect safety and efficacy result. And safety results is the coronary efficacy, is the PDL, etc. So we cannot rush. And just regarding your question, yes, I think that the perfect alignment should be part of any procedure that we are doing in a low risk and younger patients, because we are going to have to use it in the future, especially if this patient has coronary artery disease. And this uh, patient who is younger with coronary artery disease the threshold of doing TAVR should be much higher than this uh, old lady with no coronary disease. Yeah, absolutely. Last comments, uh, one. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank and you. Um, it actually tells you, was your, my, my head is spinning, that um, the uh, potential for innovation in this field is not, is not over, right? I mean, there are a lot of opportunities on planning you know, I was actually thinking about in these high-risk patients that you could potentially plan the procedure with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that you learn uh, meaningful, uh, you know, lessons and also potential variations for the next generation valve that could really help to decrease uh, the potential of um, uh, this uh, complication to happen because it's a game of going deeper and paying for more pacemakers or actually higher having more occlusions. So I really think there is a potential for, for uh, innovation in next generation technologies. That's for sure.
exactly, no doubt, a lot. Yeah. Arik, thank you so much. Sharon, Zach, Theo, thanks for joining uh, and everybody else. Uh, it was a great discussion and really complex subject. Lots of interesting points, I think, for us to all digest and think about. Arik, thank you so much. Stay safe. I look forward to seeing you, you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.